people thought that a forestry company was crazy to apply for eco-restoration license. The plantations need the forest, the forests need the plantations. A ring of peatland plantations around the larger conservation area. The populations are increasing, their catch is increasing. Conservation forests will be in a much better place in Indonesia. In this video, we talk about one of the most effective and surprising forest restoration projects of our time. Effective because it combines a robust science base alongside a skillful approach to community engagement. And surprising because it's being done by the sort of major corporation that in the past you certainly wouldn't have expected to see doing this. And doing it in a way that quite simply nobody else has done before. In the Kampar Peninsula in Indonesia, it's a plantation with a difference. It's managed by the company April, and it grows acacia for pulp and paper. So far, that's not unusual. But the company also manages half the land as wild, unspoilt forest, which is not just unusual, right now it's unique. They're also trying to restore that forest. And at April's invitation, I recently visited the Rio Ecosystem Restoration Site. I was able to speak to some of its key people about what April was doing there, and more importantly, why. Starting with Brad Sanders, the head of operations. As part of April's landscape approach, we are managing not only plantations around the ring of the peninsula, but the central core zone or and natural forest known as the peat dome. The plantations need the forest, the forest need the plantations. The plantations need the forest, first of all, again, as, as, as the natural capital, as the source of biodiversity, water, and other ecosystem services to keep that plantation productive. The forest needs the plantation to generate income. Um, in order to pay for the cost of managing and operating the RER area. On the Kampar Peninsula, there's over 344,000 hectares of natural forest remaining on the 700,000 hectare peninsula. RER at 130,000 is at the center of that core area. It's one ecosystem that we must look at in a holistic way. In addition to the team on the ground, I also got to speak to Anderson Tonote, the man ultimately in charge. He's the managing director of Royal Golden Eagle, the parent company of April. And I was able to ask him about the challenges of having pristine peatland as part of your operations. We have to recognize that we are a company based in the Riyadh province and the fact that the landscape has peatland in it, right? That's number first, number one. So the reality for us is to make sure that we manage peatland responsibly. First, we must reduce emissions. Right. There's a recognition that operations on peatland has some level of emissions and we must reduce that by good management, good water management, prevention of fires and ensuring that actually the, the, the moistness of the, of the peat layer is as high as possible. Again, that is good for forestry growth but that's also good for emissions, that's the first. The second, there's also a recognition that if we have economic activities in the ring around the peatland uh, native forest or natural forest, it allows them to actually protect as a commercially viable ring fence. And that's the model that we've been working with, especially on our peatland plantations, is that we have a, a ring of peatland plantations around the larger conservation area right in the middle. Central to April being able to make this work has been a different level of engagement with the local communities. They needed to find a way to form partnerships to keep the ecosystem healthy after a period when it had been anything but. I picked this conversation up initially with Craig Tribble, April's Sustainability Operations Manager. This was the very first village I, I visited uh, in 2015 when we had one of the worst fire seasons in Indonesia's history. Responded to a fire out here in Pelalawan where the community were burning some of the local scrubland, which you can see on your left over here, and they were um, burning that to prepare the land for cropping. Unfortunately, it was an incredibly dry season, and these fires were largely unmanaged, putting up enormous amounts of smoke, of course, and in some situations, many thousands of hectares. And so it was pretty obvious to us at that stage that communities weren't burning for a malicious intent. What the community decided they needed from us was uh, assistance with developing uh, new agricultural opportunities and that's what we can see on the right hand side here is is cooperative rice farming 
which was developed first by this community through 2015 and now is running as a successful and very productive rice farming cooperative. We extended the program, of course, now across 41 villages, 800,000 hectares of, of areas under voluntary agreements with communities. And what we've managed to do quite effectively is reduce the community's reliance on burning as a land preparation uh, tool uh, by about 90%. And we're really proud of the fact that now the Fire Free Village concept has been adopted by other commodity companies in the region, but also is now a government policy. One of the ways the company started to do this was to offer incentives to the local community. But this could easily have gone wrong, making the locals dependent on the company for payments. And April had to make sure that that didn't happen. Over time, in fact, incentives were a very attractive way of bringing people to the table. But uh, as the discussion matured and, and people sort of engaged more with the, uh, the, the agricultural elements and the land preparation elements, the incentive became less of a priority for communities in the discussion. And so in many situations, actually through our fire resilient communities, the incentive is no longer applied. Communities aren't that interested in the incentive. Uh, what they're more interested in is how to better prepare their land and the agricultural outcomes intensification, uh, for example, or better productivity from the existing land base that they've already got. So what have I learned about incentives? Uh, they need to be done very respectfully and they need to be done very patiently, uh, but they are not the whole answer. You need to be, it needs to be part of a package of solutions that communities can engage with. Before the RER was created, there had already been commercial activity in the area it was to take up. So it wasn't just a case of preserving pristine forest, but equally restoring degraded land to its previous condition. Here's Brad Saunders again. Historically, commercial licenses were issued to companies to harvest timber from this area. And to do that, these companies constructed canals to extract the logs. But when those companies finished their logging permits, they left the canals um, in place, which continue to drain water out of the peat forest, which is critical for the peat forest's sustainability and, and, and ecology. So RER has come in here um, to try to stop, and effectively stop since we've started in 2013, any unwanted illegal logging that, that may develop. Um, and we're also blocking canals and, and also planting trees in the most highly degraded areas. Uh, our most important job we can do, however, is protection of the forest from any new degradation. We do monitor continuously through camera trapping, transects, and casual observations. And through our monitoring and our inventories, we've now documented over 800 different species of fauna and flora that exist on the, on, on the Kampar in the RER area. This consists of over 300 different species of birds, over 89 different species of fish, over 70 different species of mammals, and another 100 plus species of trees. And from this monitoring, we now know there's over 69 of these flora and fauna that are globally threatened. And without the habitat that we're protecting, these specific species of fauna and flora would be more threatened unless we were here to uh, protect these, th this area. Local communities didn't exist in a vacuum, of course. They had pre-existing livelihoods based on the land and some of their practices were not overly sustainable. So how was April able to find ways to encourage them to all work together for the good of the forest? This traditionally is a fishing community. They relied very heavily on uh, access to the river, which is just over there, the Kampar River. And that was the core of their economy here locally. And they would transport the fish to local towns back up the river. When palm oil arrived and the road was built, this community very quickly shifted to focusing almost solely on the river as a primary income. And then for the first time, actually looking at uh, this peatland, uh, natural peatland forest as potential for income as well, because palm oil does offer a genuine income to smallholders. One or two hectares does provide a genuine income to smallholders. The problem, of course, with palm oil, it's a commodity and it's subject to commodity cycles. And so when the price is good, communities are enjoying the fruits of their labor. When the price is bad, they're suffering because often it's their only source of income. So we've really encouraged communities to diversify. These are naturally quite uh, rich areas, very high rainfall, um, uh, very warm throughout the year. So there's a growing phase throughout the year. And you can plant pineapples as they have here, bananas here. The rice, of course, is, is hugely productive. 
Uh, and, and palm oil can make up part of that mix as well. Smallholder palm oil can make up a genuine part of that mix. Communities have very quickly expanded into cultivating swift nests, which are exported to China. So yeah, there's a whole now for this community. They're not just a fishing community or entirely relying on palm oil, but a whole range of income sources. And that really uh, allows them to be much more, uh, gives them much more power in their decision making. They're not reliant just on one thing anymore. We're very clear about the uh, relationship with communities has to be respectful and we respect their decision making processes. Uh, We didn't decide that rice was suitable for this community. It was done uh, by the community and the local government infrastructure. They decided that rice was right for them. Uh, And all we were able to do was uh, facilitate the preparation of those landscapes. We don't pay for uh, any outcomes here. Once that incentive sort of process finishes after about a year or two, the community really is supported and, and asked to stand on their own two feet. Prior to RER establishing itself here in 2013, uh, the local uh, fishermen have, who have been fishing here for generations were using what we consider unsustainable practices that, that can harm the pip populations or the water quality. Um, things they were doing were, were, were burning the forest and the, and the banks of the river left and right. They were using uh, poisons to, to catch more fish more easily and also electric shock. Um, in the water, you know, battery packs basically to, to shock fish and, and catch them quickly and easily. Of course, these things have detrimental impacts to the long-term health of the water quality and, and the population of fish. So we wrote an agreement, we, we negotiated for several months and uh, the fishermen have now stopped these practices. And what we're seeing is the populations are increasing, their catch is increasing and, and they're quite happy with this now. Um, and even, even better, most recently, um, we're seeing evidence that fishermen from other rivers are moving into our, this area because this, this river here, the Sirkop, is now known as a very productive area as compared to other rivers where these unsustainable practices continue. We hope everyone that is coming will, will join the group and abide by the rules that we've set up. Um, and we have our rangers, of course, our security rangers who are patrolling this river constantly, um, talking with all the fishermen um, and, and socializing the basic requirements. You know, we're, we're not enforcers, but we are trying to promote good, sustainable fishing practices. And, and we hope, you know, through building trust, collaboration and peer pressure from the other fishermen who are part of the group, that we can maintain these sustainable, uh, this sustainable pathway. Another key issue for these peatland operations is that of the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases such as methane. April has invested in flux towers to help them keep track of what's really happening on the ground and just above it. We are in the greenhouse gas flux tower. We are measuring net ecosystem of CO2 and methane exchange. We are using AD coherent technique here. Uh, So this technique will measure the net uh, between removal and emissions from CO2 and methane exchange. So we should have the science, science-based understanding for minimize the impact of land use change and also to implement the peatland, uh, responsible peatland operations. Uh, the tower we're at today is inside the RER, representing the, the pristine natural forest. We've got a second tower located in a degraded forest outside the RER. And we've also got a third tower located in our, in our acacia plantation um, and all three of these towers are, are in peatland. The, the natural forest does emit carbon and does emit methane at different times of the year, depending upon the rainfall amounts. In flooded conditions, um, the natural forest is an emitter of methane, which is also a, a greenhouse gas. And it, in fact, it emits um, twice as much methane as we find in, in, in fiber plantations. On the flip side, um, in terms of CO2, the natural forest is also emitting carbon dioxide, CO2 equivalent. However, an intact forest such as we are at in RER emits half that which is emitted from a degraded peat natural forest or peat forest. We hope this will have an impact. This is some of the best data using the best instrumentation and being reviewed by some of the best scientists in the world right now. So when the data collection is uh, completed and, and reviewed by peers, We hope this will have an impact um, on on calculating and more correctly calculating the emissions from different land use types. The peatland fiber plantations, I think we'll find, are not emitting as much as people originally thought. 
and the peatland intact forests are emitting slightly more than we originally thought. Mm -hmm. So the difference between these two very different land use types will be closer together. And this will have an impact on, on how future management should, should be able to proceed. What we're trying to do is not to run away. We must recognize, yes, there are certain considerations of operating in peatland plantations. There are certain responsibilities that we have to take and precautions we have to take to continue to reduce emissions. But abandoning our peatland plantations uh, really is not, a, is not a good solution. Abandoning our peatland plantations results in risk of forest fire. Abandoning peatland plantations uh, results in actually higher emissions. Um, our initial data have shown that actually unmanaged peatlands has two times more emissions than actually managed plantations. So here are some of the key takeaways from April's work on the RER project. One, commercial plantations are needed and will continue to exist, but they can benefit by being made interdependent with natural pristine forests. There are good business reasons for doing this, but also a global imperative as expressed by the recent UN summit on biodiversity. Two, this can only be done with a respectful and active community engagement. Provide the context for communities to thrive in a sustainable environment, and they will likely be willing to take that opportunity. But it has to be a careful partnership, not one where the company dictates terms. Three, as April has shown, the relationship between forests and climate is more complex than was previously believed, and we need good information and data to be able to make the sensible decisions on the ground that matter. April has invested in gathering such data, and it should be an expectation on others working in such fragile landscapes to do likewise. 4. April may be a visionary company, but it's looking to develop a pragmatic business model that is both sustainable and profitable. In this video, we've spoken only to representatives of the company, and there are others who would criticise them. And maybe in 20 years' time, we'll look back on what they're doing now at the RER, and we may consider it crude and flawed. But the point is that right now, what they're doing is stretching our understanding of what can be done. This is how standards get set and mindsets get changed. Ten years ago, nobody was doing this much. If in decades to come, everyone is expecting to be doing more, that will only be the case because someone took the first imperfect step on the path to be followed by the next and then the next. Right now, we have to win the argument that this step today is the right one. Anderson Tonoto had some concluding thoughts of his own on these lines when I spoke to him. Environmental sustainability is business sustainability. If you're not going to be able to grow your Acacia Crascarpa sustainably on peatlands, that is a huge business risk. Right? If you're not able to uh, carbon pricing and carbon tax is, is, is a matter of time. We export our products to over 85 countries. So if you're not able to reduce emissions, uh, there'll be carbon tariffs that's going to be placed when you uh, export your products to, to other parts of the world. So to me, uh, as a business leader, we must approach environmental sustainability as a fundamental core of business sustainability. Because if, if you think that environmental sustainability is an afterthought, uh, uh, that is a recipe for disaster for any business leader. We've announced this in April 2030 commitment, our 2030 sustainability target, that every ton of wood that we're going to consume for our production, we're going to put one dollar for conservation and restoration. So we have an excess of $15 million of budget annually to fund sustainably this restoration and conservation work. When we were starting RER, RER Ecosystem Restoration, uh, people thought that a forestry company was crazy to apply for eco-restoration license. And I said, why not? Because the same skill sets to actually manage forestry plantation is the same skill sets to actually protect conservation forests. And now, seven years later, RER is is uh, the largest carbon project uh, registered on Vera in 2021. Uh, over 350 million tons of avoided emissions annually uh, with the verified carbon units to be issued in the, in the, in the coming months ahead. Right? My dream actually is not to have one RER, is to have tens and tens of RER across the whole of Indonesia. Uh, if we can really do that, I think conservation forests will be in a much better place in Indonesia. I've been chest deep on, in, in the topic of sustainability almost for eight to nine years. What I realize a lot in this sustainability space is that consistency matters. Too many companies are coming up with too many commitments and the consistency of implementation and monitoring and reporting and verification is weak. And this is why companies 
will have a lot of challenges with allegations of greenwashing, amongst others. Right? I always take this position in our company. We must, whatever we say we're going to do, we better, we must do it. But also, the consistency of, of implementation is what makes the biggest difference. So why have we at Innovation Forum produced this film? We're not doing it because the company's paying us to. We do work with them in other areas, but we've produced this film because we think it's incredibly important to tell the story of what can be achieved in a landscape if the right investment, mindset, and relationships are cultivated and deployed. I hope you find it useful. We would love to produce more of these films, and we have a couple more in the works because we feel it's important to tell the complex story of how landscapes can be protected and restored, and we hope that this might inspire others.